I am uh, sitting in today for Chairman Lee, who's running a little late. I'm the vice chair this year, Joanne Burrell, and we welcome you to our work session for January 27th. Um, we are going to move a couple of things around on the agenda, and we're going to hear from um, the county, SPLOS, from Fade to Massimo first, and the city of Ackworth, and then we're going to um, hear from our legislative consultants and then Dobbins. Right. So we're going to start with tab two, item one. Okay. Commissioners and County Manager, we're pleased today to present our quarterly update on the 2011 SPLOST. The uh, 2011 SPLOST is projected to bring in $492 million in collections, and you can see on the slide that's presented now the breakout of those collections amongst transportation, parks and rec, public safety facilities, and the municipalities in Cobb. SPLOST receipts through December of 2014, that's 35 months collected, re uh, revenue has exceeded projections by about $27.5 million, so we're very, very pleased with those um, results right now. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mayor Tommy Allegood with the City of Ackworth, and he'll be presenting the City of Ackworth's report, and then it'll be followed by a report from each department. Mayor. Thanks very much, uh, Commissioners, County Manager. Uh, before I come to this very exciting presentation for our 2011 <laughs> SPLOST update, I want to take just a minute to kind of go back over and give you a little bit of history about uh, SPLOST in the City of Ackworth. Uh, as of this past November 4th, we have passed four SPLOST, and this past November 4th, we, we passed our SPLOST uh, with all of our districts uh, passing the SPLOST by 53%, really over, a little over 53%, which was a, a record passing of a SPLOST for us. So we've had four SPLOST, and during the, the four SPLOST, which range almost uh, uh, through 18 years, we have collected and, uh, uh, and or will collect by the time we're finished with this last SPLOS, this we call this SPLOS 4, we will have collected uh, about $70 million and made $70 million worth of improvements in our city traffic through traffic solutions as well as a basic quality of life, uh, stormwater and sidewalk uh, improvements in our city. So this, this has been a very, very important uh, sustainability uh, for us to create sustainability. Take you just a few minutes to direct your attention to uh, to our uh, presentation here. First item would be uh, we had a total budget of thirteen million seven hundred twenty one dollars for our two thousand eleven SPLOST. It was a four year SPLOST. It began in calendar year two thousand twelve. And if you look at the list that we have there, we actually have uh, each year with the cash flow and the the, uh, the SPLOST projects as they have occurred. Uh, we are now finishing up the third year as of 1231, and we have uh, completed projects and drawn down on our SPLOS dollars uh, about 10,350, I'm sorry, 10,354,000. Uh, this past year we completed projects and allocated dollars of 4,868,000. Uh, this coming year will be our last year of our SPLOS. We will collect uh, $3,795,000 and we'll finish up our projects. We are on schedule and just looking at the breakdown, we've collected $295,000 a month uh, during these last three years. Uh, we have total receipts in hand of $10,354,000 and we have committed to date $9,857,000 uh, either either use those, uh, those funds in completed projects or we have a uh, project committed. In this case, the committed project is our railroad crossing project. It's $1,100,000. Our SPLOS breakdown is the following with roads resurfacing, uh, parking and sidewalk projects at 42% of our $13,700,000. Uh, $13, uh, parks is 10%, public safety 36%, railroad crossings uh, 9%, then our stormwater allocation was at 3%. Some of the projects that we have completed uh, under our roads uh, and, and parking would be uh, this project in our downtown, 60 parking places that we completed in June of 2012. We have continued to uh, improve our sidewalks. We are almost finished with our sidewalk projects, uh, resurfacing roads, 
and we've got a current uh, project that we've just begun on Southside Drive. It is a road widening project that has uh, uh, adding a park, another parking component to our downtown. Uh, under our Parks and Recreation, we have been uh, quite successful. This is a, a, a renovation that was done at our beach house. These, this beach house was built in the 1950s. Uh, this was the way that the original uh, structure looked inside the bathrooms. We used the allocation from Splost uh, to make that the upgrade. That's what we look like today. Uh, through this beach house, uh, during the summer, we've got about 150,000 people that are using uh, this beach house and using these facilities. Uh, that same 150,000 uh, also have access to our playground and playground equipment. This is before at Cobble Park, uh, we added, uh, upgraded our play, uh, playground and pavilion and there's what we look like today. Uh, this is a before and after on the upper slides there at our sports complex. We were able to, uh, through the Splice dollar allocation uh, for our parks and recreation, we were able to actually build uh, and add 80 new parking places with a, a really nice parking lot there. Here's a, a great uh, partnership with the county. It is at uh, our sports complex. It is uh, the parking for, at Kenworth Park. We're adding about 150 parking places here. Uh, once again, another great renovation uh, to our parks and recreation at Newberry Park. Uh, Mr. Weatherford was uh, uh, behind this all the way and helped to uh, to actually make this happen. Uh, there's a before and after of concession stand and what the concession stand uh, looks like today. This is the at, what, at our senior baseball field that has uh, that gets a lot of use and um, uh, really excited about this project. Well, we mentioned our railroad crossings. We are waiting at this point for our allocation of dollars from the GDOT. Uh, we have in place, we have our money in place, uh, our million dollar grant. We have five railroad crossings that we will uh, do the upgrades for safety as well as create the silent crossing. We'll be the only city in Georgia that actually has all five of their crossings that will be silent. Really excited about this project. Uh, GDOT uh, is waiting on some funding and we're waiting on them. All of the engineering has been done and completed. We expect once we get this money to be able to implement this project and finish this project within about three months. Our public safety, we had a $5 million allocation in our 2011 SPLOS. Uh, our public safety allocation helped us to build and complete a new police station uh, this year. You can see the overhead. Uh, this is a police station that was designed to meet the needs of our community for the next 50 years and we're once again really excited about this great public safety uh, upgrade and quality of life upgrade in our city. Uh, the coming, uh, this year, 2015, we've got three projects that we will start uh, that we haven't started yet. Blue Springs Road from, uh, from Main Street right by North Cobb High School all the way out to 41 uh, is going to be uh, totally renovated. Uh, Taylor Street will be renovated. We have an allocation for Logan Farm Park, which is um, a total of a $2.5 million uh, uh, improvement we're, we've got 470,000 in SPLOS 3 or a 2011 SPLOS and then we have the balance of a $2 million allocation that has just been passed uh, on November 4th with our SPLOS 4 project. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, these are our projects, this is our update and we are certainly proud uh, to have the county as our partner and to have had uh, the opportunity to have the joint projects and to, to be able to add these quality of life upgrades for the citizens of Cobb County. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mayor. Um, would you like to introduce the, your staff, Brian? Absolutely. And Absolutely. We have uh, our city manager, Brian Bulltice, uh, is here with us today, <laughs> and our assistant city manager, Brandon Douglas, uh, is here with us today, and, and our former uh, assistant city manager is also here with us today, <laughs> Mr. Benzer. So, uh, and our former uh, alderman Bob Weatherford. So we have quite we have our staff all throughout the room. Thank you. As always, good job in the city of Ackworth. Do any of y'all have any questions for Mayor Algood? Yeah. Please. <laughs> yes, I was um, picking our commissioner's ear over here, but was curious to know how you leverage the SPLOS dollars with the silent crossings. Um, were they cover just with um, SPLOS dollars in entirety or did you get other funding sources? That, that's a great question. We had in place, uh, going back to the Tom Price era, we actually had a federal grant and an allocation that, that basically 
uh, what we were able to transfer that allocation to the state and mm -hmm. and actually work through the state to create um, a, a grant and so we used uh, dollars from SPLOS to to access that uh, through the state so it's mm -hmm. through the Georgia uh, Department of Transportation interesting thank you sure Some very thank good you projects. good question anything else thank you commissioners pleasure to be here today And I see Mr. Rita's here from Property Yes, Commissioners, uh, I will be reporting on the facilities. And the first picture you see there is uh, the Health Department Annex. That used to be the Juvenile Court facility. And you see them putting in cabinetry. This slide shows uh, the whole 2011 SPLOS, 18.1 million we have. And this shows how it's broken up into those categories of public safety, other facilities, public health, judicial facilities, senior services, and the libraries. The, on the right-hand side there, you see the original project schedule. At this point in time, we had expected to have 73 projects complete. We actually now have 103 complete. We expected to have nine underway. We have 12 underway. And we have exactly five in design as we had planned. We're well ahead of schedule and we're wrapping up the last year of our SPLOST work. Next slide, please. This picture, we're gonna show some highlights of some projects that are underway as well as a couple pictures this time of some things that we're gonna be doing in the next few months. Uh, we can go back to that one. That, that other one is the uh, getting ready to put in the ceiling tile at the public health facility. Uh, the next one is, uh, this is one of the two driver's license facilities. And now the SPLOST funds a portion of it and portion of it was funded in another way. But um, those buildings are gonna be, one is in Kennesaw at the Northwest uh, Treatment Center, uh, Water Treatment Center by the Kenworth Park. And the other is on County Services Parkway, but these facilities will each have 30 units wide serving counter to serve the public. So this is hopefully going to reduce the uh, lines and people will be able to get their driver's licenses more quickly. But as you can see, the steel is going up. Next slide shows the County Services one and steel going up. By the way, the roof is on that one at this time. Next one, please. This is one of the ones that we're going to be doing over the next quarter. That's uh, the Smyrna Health Facility. That facility has wood doors, which are pretty deteriorated. That one has a lot of pain on it to make it look that good, but we're going to be replacing those with storefront doors. Next slide. This is the replacement of the heating and air conditioning underway at the former uh, satellite office over there at um, out west and as you can see I, it looks like a bunch of crumpled up metal there but what you see in the foreground are are cages and we're putting the anti-theft cages on those two units they're not real big units they're like you would have at your home and that will prevent them from being stolen next slide please this is a picture of a 30 year old air handling unit in the public safety building we're going to be replacing these over the next quarter. And this is the work that is planned for the next quarter for judicial. We continue with the design of the magistrate court and that public safety HVAC replacement. For the libraries, we're doing landscaping at Vining's Library. Continue the renovation with the health department. We're going to go into the, the uh, headquarters building in another month and start that one as this annex is near complete. The door replacement at Smyrna Health. For DOT, we're doing some heating and air conditioning replacement, as well as the same thing at the major senior centers. And then the driver's licenses, we'll continue working with those buildings. And the former purchasing building, which is now occupied by parks, will be replacing the windows with more energy efficient units. Are there any questions? Thank you.
Good afternoon, commissioners, county manager. Uh, good thing about uh, public safety, we're 85% complete. All of our projects are underway at this point. And so what uh, we are working on the last few items, we the four engines, the last four engines we'll receive off of this supply uh, should be here March of 2015. And uh, that will be a total of seven engines that were purchased uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million dollars each. On our Hazmat 22, this was a, a truck that's uh, built by Hackney VT uh, coming to the board tonight for final finance approval on that. And then once that is done, we will uh, hope to take delivery of that in October of 2015. And then on our thermal imaging cameras, uh, we have received our first delivery and uh, are in the process of getting these out in the field and just wanted to bring the one to show you how small they've become. Used to, they were huge uh, monsters to carry around. Now they're truly handheld. Uh, and keep in mind, we not only use this for firefighters who can see through uh, the smoke, but it's also good for hazardous materials. Uh, you can look at canisters or, or barrels to see how much fluid or uh, product is in a canister. We can use them with the police department uh, for people who may have uh, fled to the woods and uh, we can scan the woods with these uh, as well as an accident where a person may have been thrown from the vehicle we can use these to scan the woods to see if there's other uh, bodies around so uh, they're very versatile and uh, we had anticipated they would come in at ten thousand uh, dollars uh, technology usually drives the price higher but in this case uh, we were able to get these at seven thousand dollars each so uh, we will purchase uh, 60 of those for the fire trucks and then uh, our next quarter is just to take delivery of the engines and, um, and uh, the hazmat truck in October. And then, like I say, the thermal imaging cameras are being placed on the trucks uh, as we speak today. So that brings uh, my report to an end. Any questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners, county manager. Um, today we're going to um, talk a little bit about some finished project projects. As you know, as y'all travel through the county, uh, our park system has a lot of construction going on. It, it is, without a doubt, um, one of the busiest times ever in our park system for construction. Um, associations have been wonderful. Uh, the support that we've got from them, um, having to change their seasons and those type of things have been wonderful. We've worked hand in hand partnerships. Also, our team, um, headed up by Tom Bills and Russell Small from Moreland Out to Belly, um, Moreland um, folks are here today. They've done a super, super job keeping us on track and keeping us going. This first picture that you see, we're going to talk a little bit more about it into the slide presentation, but it is Wild Horse Creek Park, um, the new, new aqua outdoor aquatic center next to the um, Ron Anderson Recreation Center. Next slide is how our money was divided up. You've seen this slide many times over the last few years, um, so uh, it just kind of shows you where our money will be going. <laughs> Next slide is where we're at in our process. 35% um, of projects completed, 41% um, underway, 21% still under design and engineering, and future projects 3%. So we're getting there. Remember, ours is a little different because we have to play around seasons, and we're not talking about spring, salt, uh, spring, fall, and those type of seasons, but we're talking about the different ball seasons. So it's taking us a little longer than others. Um, but we're getting there, and uh, we've made a tremendous difference. The next few slides, or this next slide just shows you where projects are located throughout the county um, and their uh, state that they are in at this time. The next few slides, we're going to talk a little bit about some projects. Um, we haven't shown a whole lot of these slides in the past, but we're kind of going to let you know where we're at and, and get you, let you have a view of some of the new stuff we're doing. Uh, total budget for Al Bishop is uh, almost $2 million. We're putting a new concession restroom press box there. You can see that in the bottom slide. You can see the before and you can see the after. Uh, we've renovated the fields, new irrigation, field lighting fixtures, fencing and netting, laser playing the fields. We're about 85% complete um, and we repaved the parking lot. We plan on starting our season the 1st of April here at Al Bishop. As you know, Al Bishop, this is another picture of field renovation. As you know, Al Bishop is one of the top softball complexes in the country. Um, so we've got a lot of folks looking forward to coming back and playing there. Next project is Kenworth Park. Um, if you've been up to Kenworth Park in the last 
month, you would have think a bomb landed there. Um, but it, the, the difference we're making in that park is amazing. Uh, it was built in the early, early 70s and it needed some tender love and care. You see a new um, concession uh, restroom building here and a storage building for the association. You also see irrigation going in and you see it's purple pipe. That purple pipe say it's reclaimed water. Um, working with Steve McCullers and the water system, we're actually going to irrigate with re reclaimed water there, um, and it, that'll make a huge difference at Kenworth Park. Um, next is Kenworth Tennis Center. Um, that's completed. They're at, it's actually operating. Uh, uh, they uh, Everyone loves it. Um, it's made a huge difference in that park. The next, you see the new parking lot. The mayor actually mentioned that in his presentation. Uh, that was a joint project between us and um, the city. Uh, next is Ryan Park Development. Um, Ryan Park um, was one of those parks that were built in the early 70s. Um, had a major, major cross tie wall. You see the new wall there. We actually built a bigger wall there that would help us give us more room for the association. Um, it's made a huge difference in what they'll be able to do and what they'll be able to offer for the girls softball program. But it has new um, lighting poles, new fencing, laser graded the fields, new irrigation. Um, major water line was put in this park. I believe the next slide, I believe, shows me that. Yeah, this, this is the water line that actually is going down the bed of the creek. And so they've got the creek repiped and they're putting it in, putting it in concrete, and then they'll put the water, the water will come back in the creek and fill it back over. So that's been quite a project for us also. Uh, this park gets used a whole lot um, and uh, the, the uh, renovation is gonna make a huge difference. Next is Hyde Farm. Um, everybody's really been waiting a long time for this. This is a before and after picture. Um, this is one of the buildings that we're totally taking down um, by hand and put back um, as it was first built when it was new. Uh, pretty amazing. 11 outbuildings, uh, the house and the barn were about 75% complete there. Um, once we're complete with this construction, we'll start on the terraces and the field in the farm fields um, and my prediction is hopefully by um, next spring uh, we'll be operating that facility. But it's pretty amazing what's, what's gone on there. So, uh, Next picture shows you a few more of the gear house. We, are, we also did some surveys and some test pits out there to um, see if there was anything that we were missing. And, and so it helped us. Uh, we knew that there was an old kitchen house behind the house. And that's what you see, the little flags and stuff. Um, so we found out where that was also. Next is Shaw Park. Um, Shaw Park is another one of those parks that was built in the early 70s. Um, a lot of ADA issues at Shaw Park that we were able to go in and make improvements with the SPLOST. Uh, we also replaced some uh, concession restroom buildings, uh, worked on the ball fields and the major cross tie walls throughout that park we were able to replace. We'll be ready for opening day. This is another park of uh, a picture of Shaw Park also. Next is noon, uh, Noonday Park. This is our Eastern Zone office. If you've ever been up there, it was in an old uh, ranch style house, um, probably 60s probably. Um, it's done its, it's, done its uh, job for us and it's time for a new facility. Uh, we're actually building offices um, and we'll also have a great meeting room up there. Um, this part of the county, there's not a lot of meeting space. Um, we're actually putting a meeting room in this facility that our associations and public meetings um, can be housed there. Next is Wallace Park. Um, you've heard me talk a lot about Wallace Park through this whole thing. Um, I am, there's a couple reasons I'm so proud of Wallace Park. Number one is our staff had a lot to do. We did this a lot, our own staff did this. Um, we rebuilt the fields, we did fencing, we did buildings, we did a whole lot of stuff here. But what we did here is we made a difference in a community. We went back in and reclaimed this park. Um, it's amazing the difference it has already made. Um, they played football there this, this um, past fall, and it's amazing their program. They were so excited. They um, couldn't believe the new buildings, uh, the new field conditions. Um, we've really made a difference in this part of the county with this, with this project. You see the new playground that went in. You see all the ramping. There was a lot of ADA issues here also that we had to correct, and we were able to do that. Next is Wild Horse Creek Park. Um, this is the, um, the pool. We're actually closing the pool at Powder Springs Park um, and actually moving that or, or put, building a new facility at Wild Horse. Um, this will be an outdoor water park. Um, you can see 
right to the left on the bottom photo to the left of the recreation center. Uh, you can see the building, that's the, the, the white building you see there, and then you can see the pool uh, concrete that's already been poured there. Um, Y'all, this is going to be amazing when this is finished. Uh, kids are going to be able to walk to this facility. We already have a huge summer program at this facility. You can only imagine what's going to happen when uh, this facility opens, and it will be open this summer. That's uh, another shot of the pool, um, shot of the recreation center. And what you see up that top right-hand corner, that's kind of the lazy river. Uh, you'll be able to get in that, and the current will push you down downstream. So um, excited about this facility. Uh, recently started projects, um, the uh, Fair Oaks Recreation Center, Theater Roof, Hyde Farm, um, and uh, various paving projects throughout the county. Um, construction, Milford Park, uh, that's another one if you go by, don't let it scare you. Yes, it looks like something landed there, but um, it, it will be put back together. Um, what a huge difference it's going to make on that corner um, there at Milford Park. Fair Oaks, Lost Mountain Park, uh, Trey Moore, Jim Miller Park, construction is going on there, um, South Cobb, and then Cobblestone Golf Course paving. You, you've seen this slide many times, the impacts that we're going to have um, through the splost, air quality in our, in our aquatic centers, cross tie wall replacements, ball field lighting, uh, current code stuff that we're meeting now is fire protection, ADA, which is a huge deal for us in the park system. Uh, electrical upgrades, um, usability and, and experience, new concession restrooms that had just been outdated were able to replace new scoreboards and serving new and growing user groups. Um, that's our presentation. Any questions? Anything? Okay. Eddie, yes. um, what I'd like you to do is tell the commissioners um, where some of the materials that are being put up at Hyde Farm came from. Okay. Um, the school system bought some pro, uh, property along Terrell Mill, um, Terrell Mill Road, and it had three barns actually on it. So we took our, the, the folks that are doing our construction over at Hyde over to look at those, and we were able to take some of those resources from those three barns and use at Hyde Farm. The school system uh, were great partners in that and let us do that. So um, great partnership. The commissioner and, and Mr. Hankerson both let us help us make made that happen. Good. Presentation and the thing that I like the best is that you can see that there are parks throughout the county. Yes, it's not just one is. area or one district. Um, I mean, this is a great project list of that covers everybody's district and everybody's special park and. We're facility. making a huge difference in the county. It really um, is. The meeting room at Noonday Creek. Mm -hmm. How big is it going to be? Um, it will be compared to compared to our well, training. Well, is it training big room, enough for me to have a town hall on that be. side yes, of town? Yes, it will be. Thank yes. you. Yes. I won't have to wait for the expansion of Gritters there Library. You there you go. Thank uh -huh. you. You're welcome. So if you recall, the 2011 SPLOST uh, transportation breakout focused heavily on infrastructure preservation, followed by safety and operational improvements, congestion relief, traffic management, and transit investments throughout the county. Of 189 transportation projects, I'm very pleased to report, if you notice the bars to the right of the screen that report on actual and planned, we are ahead of schedule in terms of completed projects and are continuing to move projects actively uh, through design, engineering, and construction. Transportation um, active project status, currently there are 46 projects in pre-construction, 22 projects in construction, um, and as we've stated previously, we've completed 111 projects as of the end of 2014. Again, you can see those projects are spread throughout the county. So we wanted to highlight a couple of projects. Uh, Shiloh Shalliford Road Improvements. This was a safety and operational improvements project between Canton Road and Wade Green Road. It included a center turn lane, additional right turn lanes, increased capacity at the intersections, bike friendly lanes and sidewalks. The construction cost was $11 million and the project was substantially complete in November of 2014. Pine Mountain Road included improvements from Stilesboro Road to just east of Shillings Road, includes site and distance enhancements, 
widening travel lanes to standard widths, addition of curb, gutter, and sidewalk, the addition of turn lanes at major intersections, um, and the contract amount was $3.9 million, and the notice to proceed for construction on this project was issued this month in January of 2015. Floyd Road. Improvements from Veterans Memorial Highway to Clay Road, four lanes with a divided median, multi-use trail on the west side, sidewalk on the east side, and construct dual left turn lanes from Floyd Road onto Veterans Memorial Highway. This is a $4.8 million project. Notice to proceed was issued in January of 2015, and you can see it's going to have a, a, a just over a year, about a year and a half's construction period. So in the 2011 SPLOST, and this is one of the parts of the SPLOST that we are most proud of, as you recall from that very first slide where we talked about the relative amounts of investment that were made in transportation, this SPLOST infrastructure preservation was key, and the resurfacing um, of roads throughout the county has been both extremely popular and much, much needed. So the 2011 SPLOST resurfacing through December of 2014, we bid 13. 13 contracts valued at $64.6 million, including 1,054 roads and 326 miles. Resurfacing contracts that we've awarded since October of 2011 that includes three 2005 SPLOS contracts, 16 contracts at $76.3 million, 1,257 roads and 390 miles of resurfaced roadway. Our next quarter planned activities, we have eight projects that should be completed. That includes three sidewalk projects and five drainage projects, eight construction starts with two drainage projects, two resurfacing, two sidewalk and two intersection projects. And I should mention we really are making great headway on the sidewalk improvements throughout the county as you, many of you know, I know Commissioner Cupid especially knows this because um, we have a lot of requests for sidewalk, not just in her district. We currently have a backlog of over a thousand requests for sidewalks throughout the county. So very popular projects as well. We have four design and engineering starts that will begin this next quarter, including a drainage project, two sidewalk projects, and one roadway project. With that, any questions or comments? Thank you. It's all yours. <laughs> Good afternoon. I apologize to the board first for being late and to staff second for being late and to our guests who are here presenting for being late. I apologize to y'all. What have we covered so far? What you see right there. So let's go back to tab one. Is that okay? With the group? Community development. We received a presentation from the Community Development Agency concerning the Dobbins Air Reserve Base Joint Land Use Study. Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon, Chairman Commissioners. Uh, my name is Dana Johnson uh, with the Community Development Agency, and we are here to give the final presentation on the Dobbins Joint Land Use Study. Um, this has been a, a very detailed process um, in a time frame that was challenging uh, to staff and challenging to our, our uh, consultants with Matrix Design Group, but in the end, we came out with an excellent product, in my opinion, that shows the full coordination that happened between the partners involved in this particular initiative. Um, the city, the reason why we are pursuing this particular initiative is, is very clear. Um, Dobbins Air Reserve Base is a very important resource and asset that we have in Cobb County. Um, it, uh, to, to Current figures show that the economic impact of Dobbins Air Reserve Base is about $164 million in 2015. So, 2014, excuse me. So this is a very important resource that we have. They're an important part of our community. And the whole purpose of this joint land use study was to make sure that we were doing our part, City of Marietta, City of Smyrna, Dobbins Air Reserve Base, and Cobb County, working together so that what we're coordinating and ensuring that decisions that we're being that are being made are not having a negative impact on each other so that um, as missions change for Dobbins that they're thinking about the impact that can have on the community and vice versa as as the board of commissioners or city councils are making decisions on land uses around the base to get a good understanding and basis of knowledge and how that could impact 
flight operations and military preparedness that is occurring uh, at Dobbins. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to uh, invite Mike Rapala up with Matrix Design Group, who's going to go over the presentation. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we will come back and see if there's any questions that you have uh, for staff or, or for our consultant. So Mike, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, and County Manager. On behalf of Matrix Design Group and our Project Manager, Ms. Les Warner, who was called back to Corporate Headquarters by our CEO today, it has been a privilege to be your partner in this endeavor. Um, <clears throat> Matrix had the opportunity to help facilitate a very successful collaborative effort between the county, the cities, and the installation to address the items that um, Dana mentioned, and that's to look at compatibility into the future and to be able to provide a balanced approach as the community works with the installation uh, in the next uh, number of years. What I'd like to do is spend a few minutes <clears throat> kind of going over the process and then highlight some of the, the major items that are incorporated in the joint land use study. <clears throat> it's very important. It starts out with the fact that it's a collaborative process and we have a lot of stakeholders and it's important that when we look at the approach, we're looking at stakeholders, not only our elected officials and the agencies, but the public and the individual uh, person that's part of the community. <clears throat> it's also important that it's a set of recommendations. It's a guideline. It's like a playbook for the communities and the stakeholders moving forward. It's also important, we've emphasized this with, <clears throat> especially with the public, that the joint land use study is not a regulatory document. It's not an enfor for enforceable action. It is a game plan to move forward, and each of those actions have to be brought into the different jurisdictions on how they want to go forward and Im implement those. <clears throat> it requires a stake uh, the support of the stakeholders and the public as we move forward through the implementation phase. Our approach was to look at the different items out there and try to focus as best we can to a very specific geography because we don't want to look at things in a broad context if not necessarily. We really want to be able to, to, to develop the relationship between the influence and the effects of the military operation and the relationship to the citizens and the quality of life of the, the community. We want to minimize any controls or policies, and we want to link the solution set to tools that can be effective and useful to the different jurisdictions. So the key is to develop a game plan. This is the implementation strategy for preventing and mitigating encroachment. Mitigation is a difficult component. The biggest bang for the buck is prevention, to take the areas that you're currently compatible and to ensure that compatibility exists into the future. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the public is a key component. And we've had three uh, workshops in which, during different phases of the joint land use process, that we engage the public to provide inputs on what they thought the concerns and issues were, how we develop some of the issues in our approaches moving forward, and then the draft document in which we are looking for them to also comment on the approaches moving forward. We had a, a website. Um, that was also available to the public to be able to communicate and receive information through that process. And as I mentioned, there was a public review in January 22nd where we engaged the public on the draft documents. <clears throat> the um, the JLUS is combined of two, two documents. The one document is the background report. It's basically a very uh, technically oriented document. It addresses those five major sections in there. It gives the readers the background, the understanding of the community, the military mission, uh, the kind of tools that you already have in place and that are using, and then looking at where the potential issues and areas of focus that we need to address through the committees. The report is a smaller version of it, and in that report, it provides the first couple items as a summary of what's in the technical report to give you an overview. 
And then the, the main meat of the JLUS report is that implementation plan, that recommendations. It's the playbook, not only for the region, but it's an individual playbook for each of the stakeholders, the county, the cities, and the installation. <clears throat> this is the overall process. You can see we're f fairly long the process. As I mentioned, the public review had taken place. We're still in the final phases of the opportunity for the public to submit written comments to uh, Dana or through the website. And then we'll produce a final uh, JLUS documentation for review and, and uh, adoption by um, the JLUS committee. And then the follow-on action there is for the different jurisdictions to accept the JLUS report into their communities. What we identified was 45 compatibility issues across 24 different uh, compatibility factors. And not all factors were identified in our research uh, uh, in, with the community and in the installation. This is a summary of where the majority of the issues were identified uh, with communications, land, land use, noise, light and glare, safety, and vertical were the main thrust of the document as we move forward. We also had some guidelines that we were working forward to, it, and it was very important that we uh, respect property rights, the individual property rights, not only of the, uh, individuals but businesses. And again, as I mentioned, we wanted to really direct specific geographies to solve the problems. So we really wanted to, to spend time to ensure we had the relationship between what kind of effect there was and the geography that we we're going to focus on our uh, strategy against. We developed 81 strategies to address military operations impacting the local communities and also any activities that might have an uh, impact to the military mission. <clears throat> As I mentioned, geography is very important, so one of the elements that we are developing is a military compatibility influence area. It's kind of an overlay, and within that overlay there are several sub-areas. Sub and is again emphasizing the fact we only wanted to focus certain actions where the most important uh, impacts were. And so those sub areas are within the overall overlay area and they are focused specifically on safety, noise, light, vertical obstructions, and bash, which is a bird airstrike hazard component. A picture is worth a thousand words, and here's our picture. It's a very somewhat of a complex picture here. <clears throat> but it's made up, as I mentioned, of several components. If you look at the insert up there, you'll see the broad purple outline is reflection of what we're calling the compatibility influence area. It's inclusive of several sub-areas of it. One of them is the approach and departure quarters for the installation. The uh, blue squiggly lines in there are reflective of the noise contours. And around the, uh, the runway, you'll see the boxes that go off the ends of the runway. These are the safety zone, the clear and the accident potential zones one and two. And then the broad circle there is the bash area. It's five nautical miles around the airfield. So those are the different layers that combine focus the geography where a number of our strategies are targeted. This is again, an example of looking at <clears throat> the uh, light and glare, which is the rectangular aspect that you see in relation to the approach and departure corridors that you see in yellow and kind of red. <clears throat> and some of the key strategies here are listed on uh, the slide. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they deal with taking the situation where you're currently communicating and enhancing that communication or institutionalizing that communication, getting away from it being personal or ad hoc and putting it into some format so that it can sustain itself beyond the existing individuals. The other part of it is that we look where there were ability to um, create new links of communication between the different stakeholders and getting people that normally have not talked to them because there's no commonality, we've created the commonality of information that now through a communication process can take place. And when we talk about compatibility, there's really five areas of compatibility. It starts off with information. If you have information, you could start to address compatibility. The second one is communication, knowing who to talk to, when to talk to, and how to talk to them. The third is a communication process. 
and 85% of compatibility can be attained by having information, somebody to talk to, and a means to do it through a coordination. The last two are policies and regulatory. And the goal here is to try to achieve as much of the compatibility as we can without going to regulatory and policies. In this case, one of the key elements is to continue from the planning element, which is developing the implementation plan, and continuing into the implementation by establishing a coordination committee that will carry the implementation plan that's in the JLUS today and work with it different communities and stakeholders and make it a reality. Uh, in land use, um, there's a number of elements in there and the action really is to take these different recommendations or pieces of information of impacts and concerns and start to update your comprehensive plans and zoning ordinance. Uh, to take the key elements that are in the military compatibility influence zone in the sub areas. And this is one of the elements that we talk about when we talk with the public. This is the implementation and these have to go back to the individual uh, uh, jurisdictions and have them work it through their process. That the JLUS committee and the JLUS process doesn't dictate it. It's still your community that has to take those actions. In terms of light and glare, we want to consider dark sky ordinance to reduce light pollution that benefits not only the military operations, but also the quality of life for the community as a whole. And then when we're talking about noise, again, we're talking about um, quality of life, and we're, we're also looking for the state to adopt real estate disclosures so that the individuals, the individual homeowners, the public out there is more aware and cognizant of the potential for noise. Not that noise is bad, but it's better to know it and understand it when they make their decisions. Safety zones, this is very important. We want to make sure that we can take care of land acquisitions in the clear zone. The reason why the word is clear is it shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything in there. No humans, no structures, whatever, because it has the highest potential for aircraft accidents. And so it's becoming upon the community the government and the, the military to ensure that their operations can be conducted safely with the reduced risk to your citizens. <clears throat> Vertical obstructions. This has an impact to flight operations. What we're trying to do is to ensure that the type of operations around Dobbins Air Force Base can be conducted safely. It's also the important to understand that we have three types of aviation assets there. We have large fixed wing aircraft. We also have rotary aircraft that the guard and reserves use. And then we have all types of aircraft associated with Lockheed Martin. So as an installation, we got to ensure that all the potential vertical hazards can be minimized uh, today and into the future. So what are the next steps? I'll turn it back over to Dana. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Um, commissioners, the, the next steps in this process is we are, um, we have the draft document. Again, as, as you had previously heard, our public review period is open until February 11th. Uh, so we, we ask the, the community if you have any comments, supportive or, or some, some concerns with anything in the document, we ask you uh, to please let us know. We did receive a lot of great information at the last public meeting. I think on average, we, av we I think there were about 100 and 50-ish people who participated throughout this process were averaging about 50 to 60 people per meeting showing up, which we're very happy about. Um, after the public review period closes, um, we will make final amendments to the document, um, pass it out to everybody. I don't anticipate there being large changes, but we might get more comments um, after this hearing that we, we are not aware of. Um, but we, based on what we received so far, we don't anticipate any large structural changes unless that were to happen. Um, if the document and there's not any major changes, we will bring this forward for consideration by the Board of Commissioners in February, on February 24th. Um, if the Board of Commissioners approves this document on February 24th, we will then work with the City Councils, uh, with Smyrna and Marietta, in order to bring this forward for their consideration. Probably uh, in February, we will also be doing the work sessions with the cities, so they are receiving the same presentation that you are receiving today. We're just trying to make sure that all of our elected officials 
who need to make a decision on this uh, important matter are fully aware of what's going on, what's up to date, and, and how the process is moving forward. Uh, and with that, either, either Mike or I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have about this uh, document or draft report, and we appreciate uh, all that you've done to help us in this regard. Thank you very much, and I appreciate very much, Danny, your leadership in this important project. Commissioners, as you know, this has come to us several times in different stages we get here, um, and it's been a, a tremendous effort to get it this morning. The folks in the uh, feds were here this morning and um, indicated that this is one of the most aggressive schedules and uh, well thought out processes that we've that he, they have encountered. So it's a reflection well on us. I'd like to thank clearly the city of Marietta, Mayor Tomlin, and the staff that's here, Bill Bruton, the city um, manager, for being here. Thank you. Um, city of Smyrna has been a part of this as well, and I see that Mayor Pro Tem Pritchett is here today. We appreciate you so very much. And Dobbins has been and always has been a collective asset to our community not only as an economic driver, but as a home to so many men and women that serve overseas um, to make sure that we have the opportunity to do exactly what we're doing today, which is to collect freely without threat of, actually a lot, without threat of uh, a harm and the freedom to do what we're doing. And we appreciate the leadership of the base in making that happen, specifically Colonel Irvin. We appreciate you being here with us again today. and. Uh, your staff for being a part of this group. Um, you know Cobb County, the cities, and the citizens of Cobb County appreciate what you and your, your team do for this country and more specifically for our con county. We appreciate you um, very much and the men and women that from your, your operation that are serving overseas. We hold them dear to our heart and in our prayers and thoughts and, and stand ready to assist our families in any way possible uh, who stand back here in, in anticipation of their return. So we appreciate you so very much what you've done. Um, this effort we've taken on is very important to the future of that base. That base is very important to the future of Cobb County and we understand that and that's why we took this project on. Um, there's moving forward, once we've gone through a lot of the steps that Dana has talked to, well, some of the things we will be doing is putting a an implementation oversight committee is no, we have a report that's going to ask for recommendation. Assuming it's just adopted by everyone, we're going to put a team together to make sure that we're moving on it and it doesn't become a plan that collects dust on the, on the shelf. And of course, that committee will make annual reports back to the Board of Commissioners and any city council that re requests it. Um, we noticed uh, recently that there's part of the actual area that's of, of a consideration and importance to us to look at it falls into the cities in the Fulton County. Once this report is done, we don't have jurisdiction, obviously, but we'll take this report data to them for their consideration to um, implement a program on their behalf, on, a, on, on their, from their perspective, um, hopefully to, that complements what we've done. And then we uh, also anticipate taking that report and sending it uh, to our legislators, both locally and federally, so they're aware of what we're doing as well. Um, and we'll continue to move forward and make the changes and adjustments that we need to do in our planning documents so that we could be um, as cooperative as possible. It was noted to me in one of the meetings that we were in that across this country, this process is done. Um, very rarely is it done as quickly and as thoroughly as we have done it, and the cooperation is, is what's contributed to that success, and I appreciate that. There's also, across this community, community or across this country, communities that have done this study and then let us sit on the shelf, and it's had a negative long-term effect on our base, and we're not going to let that happen here in Cobb County. So I want to thank everyone involved for making this happen. I appreciate it. We look forward to the final report and moving forward on its recommendations to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can. The one thing just for folks uh, that wasn't mentioned is that it, this report will demonstrate clearly that the development down associated with SunTrust Park is outside of the area of concern and as a result that project is not necessarily influencing what's what's within this report. And any other comment or questions? Yeah, Commissioner Ott? Um, first off, I just wanted to um, add my thanks, Dana, to you and your staff and also to the, all the members of the committee who spent a lot of time working on this. Um, you did answer my one question I was going to ask about the Fulton County part, the little squiggly line. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, Dana and I met and talked about this yesterday 
and shortly after I met with some developers for land that was in this area and we actually had the discussion and I was able to refer to the various things um, the, the noise and the building height so that when they were looking at what the future redevelopment of their property could be you know I told them that these would be some of the things that we would be looking at so we've already got a chance to use it so thanks perfect Commissioner Merle thank you yes I would like to echo to the thank yous to the committee and matrix and you and your staff Dana always a great job um, I attended the majority of the open house um, meetings and they were very well attended and we actually got some really good feedback and input from citizens which is why we do open houses to get that kind of um, input so um, I would just say congratulations and good job and thank you for all your hard work thank you Commissioner Cupid yes also to echo the sentiments of the other commissioners I was absolutely blown away by the work product that was shared with us it was one thing to talk about what could come out of this study but to actually see all the recommendations and to see how well-rounded they were not just to emphasize the um, technical aspects of it and the infrastructure but to also spend similar amounts of time talking about the community impact and various areas for us to consider I just want to share with all of you that worked on this you guys um, had a, a job well done here and I think this is a document that all of us will be able to refer to as we're making decisions today thank you and, and hiring matrix was Thank great you. recommendation Dana so thank you for your team and that they did a great job as well I agree sir and if I can I want to thank Celeste Mike and Patrick who are the three individuals who uh, dealt with us the most from it for matrix we're very pleased with their um, with their work product I want to thank Kieran for all of her work and support and helping us with this process and obviously all of our partners with Dobbins Marietta and Smyrna I want to echo what you all have said and just thank them for helping us be successful in this terrific we look forward to your final report. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's going to take us back to tab two, item two, to authorize, well, to, actually to authorize, but we want to get a report from Garrett McNatt, Hennessy and Carpenter, is 360 LCC, to present an update on state and federal legislative consulting activities by the firm on behalf of the county. Who is going to lead? Good morning, sir. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon. And I think it's a light, slight presentation from uh, uh, four of us, uh, if you don't mind. Here are a couple of handouts. We'll need your name for the record, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'm Heath Garrett, uh, managing partner for Garrett McNatt, Hennessy, and Carpenter uh, Law Firm. Uh, it's a pleasure, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, to be before you today. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, we are a full service law and government relations firm based here in Cobb County. It's, a, it's, it's really a pleasure to be home today. As many of you know, I've probably spent the better part of the last 24 months traveling around the southeast and actually the whole nation. And I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't take for a second uh, the opportunity to remind us that we don't want to take for granted the county that we live in, the cities that we get to operate with, because in my job and what we do, we work with a lot of cities and a lot of counties, a lot of state and government and federal elected officials. But it really is true when you get outside of Cobb County, you recognize how fortunate we are to, to be governed by folks like you, but also to be served and managed by folks like those making the presentation today. And it really is true. We don't, it's not just public relations and marketing on our behalf that we do are fortunate to live in one of the best run and best governed counties, not only in the Southeast, but in the nation. And we're recognized as such by elected officials around the country. Our reputation is strong, our brand is strong uh, among uh, not just other county officials, but uh, folks around the nation. When you all brought us on a few months ago to begin the professional services of government relations, I'm oftentimes reminded when I talk to folks about this that uh, that we are in the government relations and advocacy business. Everybody is, and elected officials, uh, state and local governments, and uh, I oftentimes remind my minister and uh, our local publisher that uh, the right to petition your government is right there in the First Amendment, right next to freedom of religion and the freedom of the press. And so we're not a, we should not be ashamed that we're engaged in the government relations process on behalf of our clients uh, legally and otherwise. And it's something that we are excited and, and a service that we're glad to provide uh, for our home county. It is uh, when we began the process, we knew that the county uh, had previously uh, had professional uh, services here, but that had lapsed for a number of years. 
And we thought that it would be good to take our time to listen to, to you, the elected officials, many of the folks in the different departments. And we began an arduous process, it's not yet complete yet, of what we call an audit of elected officials that serve Cobb County at the state and the federal level, of their staffs, of you and of the staff here in Cobb County, to listen and to learn and to figure out how we can better organize and prioritize uh, the representation of the county's needs. As you know, we are a large county, a very diverse diverse county and our economic interest and all the things that we do. We're obviously a huge center for business uh, and we have a lot, we're obviously being the most affluent educated county in metro area. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do. There are so many opportunities and we've been listening uh, for the last six months and what we presented to you today is a, uh, it's a combination of uh, priorities that we've distilled up from you and from uh, the folks that work with you. Uh, I will say as a generalization uh, that as we've talked to uh, state elected officials, their staffs, federal elected officials, uh, that we can, as a preliminary report, report back that our brand among those elected officials is really strong and positive, and that's good. There are a lot of maybe counties and other municipalities that would prefer to be in our position when it comes to that. But one of the things we've also discovered is that because we're such a large county, because we have so many strong voices out there, one of the uh, constructive uh, requests as we talk to those folks is to see if, if we can find a way to provide a greater organization and prioritization for the things we're asking for. And uh, that's a challenge for all uh, really large counties and really large organizations when you have so many people and things to do. But that's one of the things that we're going to continue to work for. We are continuing to meet. Uh, we obviously have follow-up meetings with, with each of you over the next few months we need to do. And as a reminder, this process is a dynamic process rather than a static process. These priorities will change as your priorities change, as the priorities of the people of Cobb County change, and you present those to us. And so we both uh, work on the offense in the sense of promoting the legislative agendas that you have at the state and the federal level. But at the same point in time, we have to, we represent you and we oftentimes have to play defense. There are a lot of folks out there around the state and around the country that have good intentions, but may not recognize the unintended consequences of what their legislation they're proposing may have for the county and for the citizens of Cobb. And so we'll be dynamic in helping to represent you in that regard. I'm pleased that our firm uh, partners are made up of individuals who have served at the highest levels of local, state, and federal government around, around the country. We have three of our partners here today I'd like to introduce to you. We have Mitch Hunter, the former Chief of Staff for Congressman Phil Gingry and an advisor to many of the state's uh, elected officials over the past uh, decade and a half and a great partner of ours at, at the federal and the state level. Uh, we have Chuck Clay. Many of you know Chuck. And he used to serve uh, this distinguished body and is here with us today. We'll be hearing from Chuck in just a second. And I also want to introduce Heather McNatt Hennessy. Heather is the former Chief of Staff for Jack Kingston and uh, resides in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do have a Washington, uh, an office here and an office in Washington, D.C. to serve uh, you better. So uh, with, without further ado, I'd like to call up Chuck Clay to give us a report on the state legislature and uh, discuss our state priorities you have before you. Again, thank you, guys. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't say uh, first Chuck Clay. I'm in a partnership here with the uh, 360 group, which is a fine group of folks. My focus will primarily be on the state legislative side, which is where the fundamental focus of my background has been. But again, having been a, having started at the lowest rung you can start in the legal community, which is running traffic court in Cobb County in 1978, I'm not sure that I have risen on the ladder, but I at least have gone <laughs> parallel over the last 35 years. Uh, uh, so it is, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I also know at a certain time of day, less can be better, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time sort of getting into weeds on issues unless you want to address or talk to me directly about them. We have distributed what was a starting list of priorities, uh, and, 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 and some of them are the macro 30,000 foot transportation funding. Yes, is transportation a key issue? Yes. Is there some discussion and hopefully likelihood, knock on wood, that there might be some action by the General Assembly uh, this year uh, to not just uh, have a revenue neutral bill, but actually to enhance dollars in the transportation slash transit slash infrastructure arena. Because as you all have read and know, we're about a $1.5 billion shortfall every year in just maintaining what we have. In a community like Cobb that has been so far ahead of the curve in many cases, 
because of the wise investment of you guys and your predecessors in infrastructure, uh, you know, Cobb has continued to be a, 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 a top destination for business and families. Georgia needs to do the same. Some of them are a little closer. There's a request for a technology fee. We'll be talking to your local legislation to help impose a, by local legislation, a fee to pay for the technology that your courthouse needs, uh, both for terms of security, efficiency, and simple justice, uh, and uh, be looking at those types of issues. Education, capping the uh, uh, QBE fair share is something that Cobb County's always supported. Uh, you know, I put in legislation on that 10, 15 years ago. I'm not sure that the likelihood it'll fare any better <laughs> today than it did tomorrow. But, but I do think this governor is very sincere on his, on his education revision committee that he's putting together, much like you just heard from Matrix, to come back with some mandatory recommendations. Doesn't directly impact the uh, county commission, but that which reduces the pressure on QBE and fair share funding is not only good for education, it's good for the taxpayers and homeowners in this community, and you all know that, and we support those kinds of efforts in any way we can. One of the things I always try to say, and you all know this, but uh, while having maybe a short-lived uh, career on the county commission, uh, when I went to the General Assembly, one of the things that sort of struck me as being very different is the, 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 uh, the idea at one level, you need three votes. <laughs> at uh, the General Assembly level, you need either 29 or 91. Uh, that's not good or bad, but there's a little bit of a, a, a difference in how you politic, how you proceed, and the need. And yes, I'm honored to be here, but I also think if I wasn't here, you should have somebody representing to you. Because when you need to rally up 29 votes or 91 votes, when you need to know who that chairman of the Appropriations Committee is or the subcommittee on higher ed, which is Earl Harehart right now, which has done great wonders for, uh, for Cobb and the higher education system here, those things are not as easy to do as walk down the hall. And it is important. It is important that you have some level of both continuity, yes, relationships. It's not magic. In many cases, it's information. But if you're not there, if you don't have somebody day in and day out, I used to say as a legislator, there was plenty of folks that I could go out and buy me a hamburger for lunch. I didn't really need that. What I need is when I've got a complicated issue that's impacting my backyard, I want to be able to go to one person and get an answer. I may take five minutes, I may have to get back, but a person that I knew that at heart represented the interest of whether it be back, well, to take the entity, whether it be a Home Depot or, or, or Dobbins Air Reserve Base or uh, Cobb County Board of Commissioners or, you know, the old Bell South years ago. It doesn't matter. I always respected those. One of them was one of your peers right now who could bring you timely information when you needed it to make the best decision you could day in and day out. So I wasn't wondering on a day-to-day -day basis, well, who do I go to for this? Who do I go to for that? And Heath is right. There's as much defense as offense. There's no magic thing overnight, though. There's certainly any issue that are a priority to you will be a priority to me. But I do think it's important that you have that consistent voice day in and out, year in and year out. And whether it be Commissioner Ott had mentioned this library issue that I was not aware of, but we'll certainly go to bat on and see, that's just politics. I mean, and we need to correct the politics. Uh, and uh, we'll do it any way we can. Some of that may involve you all coming down. I always say you only lobby as well as what you represent and you all represent the best. So there may be times and places during the session, whether it be for a hearing or a meeting or just one-on-one, -on -one, or if you even want to do so for your own issues and reasons and edification and, and just wanting to meet particular individuals, uh, certainly let us know. But there may be times where the most critical thing is one, two, three, four, all of you come down and throw your weight and put a face on. It's not just Chuck Clay or Heath Garrett or, or Mitch talking. Uh, you've got the weight of a consensus of your county commission who represents the people of this community behind you too. Um, again, you've got this list in front of you. I won't belabor it other than to, to say I'm enthusiastic. I enjoy being an advocate. I like doing it as a prosecutor. I like doing it as a lobbyist. I even like it even better when it's in my own backyard with people I know and respect in a community in which I, I live. So when I can be of assistance to any of you, we'll get re weekly reports. They'll be disseminated to each and all of you. Questions come up. I do want to be your point and any time and place I can help any of you, from uh, commission, county manager, staff, let me know, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Welcome Chairman. Home. Hi, Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. My name is Heather McNatt Hennessy. I'm a partner at Garrett McNatt Hennessy and Carpenter. I was thrilled to be here and get to see the Dobbins presentation. That is certainly something that is critical to your federal affairs efforts. Um, and as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, when that presentation is ready for prime time, we'll be part of that effort to get that presentation distributed to all of your federal affairs representatives. You do have some new members in Washington, so getting that uh, in their hands and making sure that they're aware of all the issues that face the base is uh, certainly on our list of things to do. Um, the list that you have in front of you for your federal affairs is our best guess at what Congress is going to try to accomplish in the next six months. You note that Dobbins is not on there, going back to the defense versus offense uh, theme that my colleagues have been presenting. BRAC is not currently being considered by Congress right this minute. The President will probably make the suggestion in his budget again. It's something that he's done several years in a row. It's a revenue raiser, so it's tempting for any president to include as many revenue raisers in their budget as they can find. That way they get to put some negatives in the negative columns and then add pluses in the plus columns. Um, we all heard the State of the Union address last week, which did include a lot of new initiatives with big price tags. So BRAC is one of those initiatives that every president can could repeatedly suggest, which requires congressional approval to become reality. But nevertheless, the president gets the benefit in his budget of having that suggested cut. Um, nevertheless, playing offense on BRAC right now is incredibly important so that when it does come around again, and it, and it may be uh, a couple of years before it does, but when it does come around again, we are well positioned to play defense. Um, so this was very fortuitous that I got to be in the audience today. We'll certainly be watching as that comes back around. But to the more immediate issues at hand, <coughs> Congress has got to reauthorize transportation funding. The Highway Trust Fund is going to run out of money in a few short months. They enacted a temporary plug uh, in the last summer that funding is going to fall short. It was a tax code change, which just provided uh, several billion dollars to fund transportation funding. So Congress has to act on that. Of course, Georgia has a tremendous amount at risk in any transportation debate because we are a donor state. And any transportation official around the state has to uh, ride the waves of these funding shortfalls as Congress increasingly lets transportation funding get closer and closer to the cliff before they reauthorize it every time. You may remember last August, the Secretary of Transportation had actually sent out instructions for what would happen when the trust fund ran out of money. They were fully anticipating that Congress was not going to be able to get a bill enacted. So. You know, tiptoeing closer and closer to that line at the federal level every time this comes around creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty for all of you, tremendous amount of uncertainty for your staff, uncertainty for GDOT, and is a terrible situation all the way around. How they're going to fill the funding gap is, is very unclear. We've heard talk of gas tax increases. I think that's probably a pretty remote uh, possibility. Some sort of additional changes to the tax code is probably more likely. That's a tempting way they can get three or four years of funding before they have to deal with this again. And with other tax code changes on the horizon, that's probably what they will choose to do. Um, the second item on the list is municipal bond tax policies with Cobb County's uh, stellar um, bond rating and all of the need that you have to be able to put forth bonds to finance projects. It's really critical that Congress doesn't change the tax code status of tax exempt municipal bonds to make it more expensive for you to borrow money. And that's what this string of proposals would do in one form or another. 
Uh, the president's budget has suggested this. Various high-ranking members of Congress have suggested this. It's very troubling. Um, we're participating in a coalition, the Bonds Build America Coalition, which is a group of you know, very high-ranking aviation experts, um, people who monitor building hospitals and other healthcare facilities that are bond financed, other major infrastructure groups who are working to preserve that status of tax exempt bonds so that the cost of borrowing money doesn't get more expensive for all of you. And then federal grant funding to make sure that the county is able to tap into grant funding when you need to and that the county really gets its fair share of federal funding those grant pots have to be as healthy as possible. Um, the sequester budget cuts, which you know we've all kind of put out of our minds because Congress took them away for two fiscal years, they're set to resurface again. And that's an issue for all domestic spending as well as defense spending. So replacing those sequester cuts so that domestic and defense spending pots remain healthy and so that when the county does need to apply for grants from HHS or DOT or some other federal agency where you are entitled to compete and you can put forth a compelling application that you get your fair share of federal funding. And then um, finally, the Kennesaw Mountain uh, Battlefield uh, to include the historic Wallace House. This is something that requires an act of Congress. Uh, it did make some progress last Congress but unfortunately was not able to get across the finish line. So that's something else that we hope to sort of push forward here in the first half of this year. So um, any questions, we're happy to answer. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mitch? Yeah. Um, if, if we have any questions or comments on either the federal or state agenda, I guess I should introduce myself, Mitch Hunter. Yep. Um, I am actually the serve as the point of contact over both the state and federal um, uh, lobbying efforts. And um, uh, just if y'all have any comments or questions for the uh, uh, issues placed ahead on both sure. the federal and state agenda. Well, let me let me say this first, and and then thank you guys for being here and, and presenting this to us. I know you've done a lot of work getting to this point, background work. Um, as was mentioned by Heath, we used to have federal representation um, back in 2009 and, and prior to that. Um, we have never really uh, collect, had a collective thought process for the state. Um, this board was, for, or board was um, uh, agreeable to appoint someone that could, and we actually went out to the RFQ and RFP, whatever process we used to go out um, to come up with a representation, and you guys are those folks. And we appreciate that. Um, as Chuck will tell you, and as you folks will tell you, and as this board is aware, uh, when you have this kind of fluid information going on where something can change 16 times between 10 a.m. and 3, 3 p.m., it's important that as we try to coordinate where we stand on positions, that we have a flow of communication that's succinct. And to that point, we had asked for a point of contact, which is Mitch Hunter. So. Mitch will, will be that person. It's not to say that Chuck won't call me occasionally and say, I need to know what's going on with X, Y, and Z, and we can comment. I can comment to that. We've, Mr. Hankerson and myself, are working as direct contacts with Mitch to help funnel information from the ward to Mitch and to the state. Obviously, they're going to have open com conversation and dialogue with the, the entire board, but in an attempt to help make sure that we're clear in how the direction is going, uh, we felt that that was the best route to go. With that, that's why they're here. They're here to present what they've heard from all five commissioners. That should be some things that are considered this year. Uh, it doesn't mean things won't come up in three weeks. It won't mean that something will fall off when it's made clear by the governor. I'm not touching that, in which case we, we take it off our list and move to the next thing. So we have to understand all that. And I see that somebody's presented a East Marietta Library. What? In a minute. In a minute. So, so this kind of stuff, uh, if the individual commissioners have got something they want promoted, it's got to flow through the county manager's office if it, re if it in pertains to his budget and his staff and his resources. Staff has got to get his okay and his consensus to bring it to me, to bring it to the board, to bring it to Mitch. 
it's only important that he be aware and be able to manage the resources that are coming and going um, as it relates to the, the things within his budgets and his jurisdiction. So I say that out of clarity so that we make sure that um, when Mitch goes down and tells Chuck to go do this, that he's got the county manager's concurrence on projects that are within his, his purview. So that's important that we do. Um, so with that, Mitch, I know that there was a couple questions from some of the commissioners on some of the items that are listed um, on these two sheets. Um, I'm going to start with Commissioner Ott because I know he wants to address the Marietta Library, and I'm glad that was brought forward. I wish it was brought forward earlier by staff, but we're glad it's here. I know that there's a long history about that. Well, just, just to kind of clarify, um, we actually did go through the um, – did talk to the county manager, and what we were asked to do – and county staff was asked to do was to prepare exactly what you're yeah. looking at yeah I agree I appreciate and, um, that. and so that's why it's here today um, we need dates by and, the way and basically what ha just so the board knows what happened with that um, East Maria library there is a list downtown of libraries that and East Maria library has success you know continually moved up year after year because the county has the county staff has talked to the, the folks downtown as to exactly what they're looking for um, they wanted matching funds and they wanted renderings and so the county has gone and done that. Matching funds were in the 2016 SPLOSC. Um, what happened basically just a week ago was we were passed over by the number below us. And so that's why all of a sudden this came up. And so like I said, I talked to the county manager and he said do a point paper. And so that's what's in front of everybody. Um, the other question I had, and Mitch, you and I talked about it before the meeting, um, and it was just kind of to clarify item number two, exactly what it is that um, that you are going down and talk to the legislature about concerning host it, yes the current host um, statute um, um, <coughs> which uh, uh, is has been used by <clears throat> two counties the cab county and rockdale county um, it is one that uh, uh, many believe um, needs improving. This conversation began with our friends in Cherokee County um, uh, about how could we actually make the current host statute one that is, provides more benefit to the taxpayer. And um, so there's been a discussion through uh, facilitated by ACCG about how that statute could be improved that would benefit the taxpayer in, um, in a number of areas which I can get into the specifics but we can talk about that more if you'd like and and and, and then um, so that any county who chooses to um, consider um, a host which would require um, local legislation and then it would re or require an act of the Commission and local legislation and then a referendum but any county that chooses to to uh, uh, propose a host um, which um, that, that the, the statute it, it works better for the benefit of the taxpayer so there, that's a two-step process first there's some cleanups that have been recommended um, by ACCG and that's what this is about it, it provides you guys the opportunity and the options to consider a host in the future should you desire it does not say, it is not an act saying that you guys have, to, that the Cobb County Board of Commissioners have decided to move forward with a host. It just cleans up the statute so that should you guys ever want, want that as, an oper as a choice and, and the ability to move forward in that direction, um, you can do so. <laughs> Three counties in the state, it would apply to Cobb, Gwinnett, and Cherokee, because those are the only three counties who do not have a, either a lost or a host. Thank you. And a little bit more background on that is the Cherokee did bring this forward a couple of years ago. And as it currently reads, the statute reads that you have to have a, it's a two question process. And it has to be an affirmative in both questions in order for it to pass. And I believe what happened in Cherokee County is that one of them did well and the other one didn't. So our hopes, the hopes are here. Cherokee approached me as part of the Metropolitan Chairman's uh, uh, group that meets if we would support helping them get legislation um, through the ACCG um, modified so that we can change, make some of the changes in legislation to, to put it on one question primarily and also put some protections in there 
uh, for the citizens as, that don't exist in current legislation. Um, Gwinnett was uh, Gwinnett was asked to support, and they will be providing the support and, uh, for the changes that come forward as well. Uh, Chairman um, Nash is as well aware of what this program is through the ACCG, and and that's where we're heading at this point. So. Right now, what we're doing is wanting to support ACCG in their attempt to try to find ways to make the legislators, the leg, make the, the legislation easier to implement. Should we try to go down that hat, that route? And 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 that that pretty much answers my questions as Mitch did earlier. That that this is basically working on that process, and that um, you know as as we talked about that I think we're going to have some discussion at the retreat about the host, and and then um, that there were other actions required by the board. So thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board for Mitch regarding any of the items on the state priorities or the federal priorities? Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate your team being here today. We look forward to working from you in what we call these the 40 most dangerous days of the year. So thank you very much. Appreciate you. So that takes us to tab three. We have one item for our, our county finance, and that is to present the information regarding the annual operation of the cobblestone golf course hey bill good afternoon chairman commissioners county manager i have uh, uh, just a minute bill colonel it, you, you don't want to stay for our golf report <laughs> that's cool <laughs> 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 wow. yeah. we appreciate you being here sir no melody as well thank you My own. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Sorry, Bill. That's okay. All right. I'm here to present the annual update for Cobblestone. I'm really just going to be introducing the guys that you really want to hear from, our Mosaic Group uh, partners with uh, Cobblestone Golf Course. Before we get into the 2014 operation results, I wanted to just brief the board on the previous actions that were taken back in 2012 that have really gotten us to this point. And in 2012, we entered into an agreement with Mosaic and to talk about how we could better improve the golf course operations. And at that time, we reduced our outstanding debt, which was over a million dollars. We uh, purchased new golf carts and equipment for, for Cobblestone. We established a reserve policy and we basically took board action to repay the general fund loan that had accumulated over the years as we were making debt service payments. During that time, we also established a working capital of $100,000 and agreed to come back to the board on an annual basis to give an update. Next slide. And at, during that time, we extended our contract with Mosaic for 10 years to give them more um, authority to run and manage the golf course. This gave them the, the power to use their purchasing authority for their other golf courses to get us better prices on the items that we needed for our course and give them more freedom to run it like a business. And being that this course is run like a business, I wanted to point out in the last 10 years, this course has been profitable every year except for one, and that was in 2010 when we were hit and recovering from the flood. So every year in the last 10 years, with the exception of a historic flood, this course has made money for the county. and. We're going to get into how that has transpired to our loan repayments. Before we entered into this agreement with Mosaic, we had over $4 million of outstanding debt, which the general fund had lent the golf course over the course of uh, several years as we were making debt service payments. The first two years in this agreement, we've been able to pay back over $700,000 to reduce that loan. This year, we've had some struggles, which Mosaic will get into, but again, a profitable year we are able to now pay back an additional $195,625 to further reduce that loan. So in a three-year period, we have paid back over $900,000 to reduce that loan. And then below on this slide, you'll just see a quick calculation of how we achieve, achieve the, the $195,000 that we will repay. So again, struggled this year a little bit, but again, positive year. And I'm going to let Mosaic tell us how we got there and how we achieved those results for the year. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Willie, uh, president of Mosaic Clubs and Resorts. And I think we've been doing this since Bill mentioned, uh, since 2012, coming to this meeting and giving you updates. Uh, so um, I need my little 
I guess I need something to change the slide with. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, about a year ago, actually, we were coming to this meeting and we got called back because of the weather, the ice storm of this particular month. Uh, and Could have gone all thank goodness, afternoon uh, we, without we talking about that. <laughs> we, um, why that's so relative is, is we, we occurred with that... Uh, had an impact on our golf course, in particular our Bermuda grass. And so we started off the year um, in January and February, our greens were covered for, for 19 days. Uh, Bermuda grass greens, if it's under 30 degrees for a period of time, you need to take precaution and cover them. So it shows you some significance that we had to cover the greens 19 days last year in those two months where the prior year we didn't have to cover them at all. Um, this year we've covered them about seven days thus far, but we haven't had near the uh, extreme weather that we faced last year to the to this point uh, so we're crossing our fingers but many of the north facing slopes uh, shaded areas of the course uh, you know snow was on there for much longer than normal and we we had uh, some winter kill we lost over two acres of turf uh, last year and uh, so it took us a while to repair that throughout the the spring and the summer uh, and, and we weren't the only ones there's many courses in Georgia uh, had that same problem and Sod became not only hard to get, but extremely costly to, to provide sod for the golf course. But it's one of those things when you have an incident like that, you really don't have a choice. You've got to put sod back down uh, or you won't have any grass to play off of. So um, the recovery period, you know, did hurt our rounds of golf in the spring and the summer somewhat. And, uh, but by the uh, late summer, fall, we had pretty much full recovery. And I feel like we're going into the winter in good shape. This year, um, we, we have brought in a new golf course superintendent as far as 2015 goes and a new super assistant superintendent. Uh, they brought us some little different approach and agronomic experience. We felt like it was the right move there. And so far we've been very happy with that. Uh, that change really made back in uh, August or September of last year. We also overseeded our fairways, which had been a practice we hadn't been doing for a while. We wanted to give the grass again some buffer and, and we thought overseeding the fairways would be a good idea this winter. Uh, and it's also led to some great playing conditions where there's very few courses in the city that have green fairways and we're capitalizing with uh, some added revenue. So we're excited about what that's brought us really in, a, in an instant where we thought we would do it to help the turf. It sort of brought back that idea that, that overseeing can be a positive thing from a revenue perspective. So it's more than paying for itself thus far. Uh, we have a new head professional. Uh, and we've been very happy with him. Steve Wagner has been with us for uh, off and on with the course, and we've elevated him. Uh, he's a PGA professional, and he's done a great job with sales. Uh, also, try to look closer at uh, some of the supporters who've been with us at Cobblestone at playing golf and spending money with us as far as supporting them locally with uh, some of these food and beverage items, such as snacks and coffee and, and water. Uh, and we, this has been a, been a positive thing for us as well. Uh, we always talk about the golf association out there. It's the Men's Golf Association and how they've been such a supporting group for our, our <coughs> course out there. Uh, we're up to 120 members, which is our highest count. Uh, it's really made up of, of people that play the golf course quite regularly. Um, they continue to work with, with us as managers to increase the membership, promote the discount card sales, and help us draw more revenues to the course. And they really become our ambassadors of Cobblestone uh, in, in a great way. Uh, they hold tournaments throughout the year, which we typically get an average of 80 or so per event. Uh, in, in 2015, there's 15 events scheduled uh, throughout the year. Uh, some of those are multi-day tournaments, and, and then it's been a very positive group that, uh, that we work with. Um, through, that, through that association with the MGA, they've also generated another $9,000 in, in merchandise revenue for the course. All their tournament prizes go towards... Uh, when their matches go back to the course level as far as uh, prizes go. And then for the second year in a row, uh, the MGA partnering with the Cobblestone Junior Golf uh, held consecutive tournaments to raise money for the Ackworth Police Department's uh, community outreach. Over $3,000 was raised and over 300 toys were collected uh, for families in need this past Christmas. So that's been a great relationship as well. The junior golf program is so important. Uh, as you know, the game of golf, many of you, is, is struggling overall nationwide, and so getting people to continue to play in our future is important. So the junior golf program, led by Joyce Wilcox out there, has been outstanding. She's uh, been three years in a row. She's been a top 50 instructor for kids. 
Uh, she's a master junior golf instructor, uh, and she uh, has been recognized uh, with a lot of awards, and we're very proud of her. Uh, we conduct 11 weeks of junior golf camps each summer with uh, 100 plus children participating. Uh, we also offer uh, golf instruction in the fall and the spring after school programs. And we have a multitude, multitude of uh, ranges for the kids from five years old, really from kids trying to make their high school teams as well. So it's, it's a wide variety of, of ages. Um, as far as uh, one, one other unique event, they've organized a, uh, a weekly golf instruction group for mothers of students that have shown interest in the game of golf. So trying to get the mothers involved as well to play golf and, and learn the game. On to our equipment, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, we, we did get some new golf carts in 2012. And uh, the problem with golf carts is you know, a busy course like Cobblestone, it's very important to have good golf carts so their experience is, is uh, a good one out there. About two thirds of our rounds ride, ride golf carts and about a third still actually walk the course today. Um, we uh, Usually these carts, uh, given the rounds, they, um, the features are changed out about every three years or 2,000 hours is what's recommended. So our, our third year is actually coming up in June. Uh, we have had some uh, battery repair work done on the carts. They're all electric carts and the batteries are the key to, to golf carts. And so uh, we're watching those closely uh, as we come up upon the three year term. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to watch that, but uh, we're, go we're in good shape as far as the carts go at this point. Um, we are looking to add, again, to enhance our business and the revenues, some pieces of equipment in the kitchen um, to help the uh, quality of food and increase some of the number of food offerings we can have. Uh, one of those is a convection oven and uh, also some cooler space. So we're very limited on what we can store in the, in the clubhouse. Our maintenance equipment is in good shape. Uh, again, so important that uh, staff does a good job of keeping that um, with repair tickets and making sure everything's on uh, maintenance records and that's going very well as far as the equipment goes. I'm going to let Terry, who's our general manager, Terry Harnage, uh, take over here and keep going. Thanks again for having us again here today. It's a pleasure to come before you all. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about Cobblestone Golf Course. Um, golf, golf tournament activity is obviously a big part of what we do. We have a lot of uh, tournaments that we hold at the golf course, and early indications are that this upcoming year is going to be a banner year for us. We have many tournaments already on the books. Last year we held over 50 events, uh, ranging in sizes all the way up to uh, 160 plus. Um, one of the tournaments that we have uh, actually down at the bottom of the page is the uh, the tournament we host uh, in cooperation with Cobb County to benefit the uh, Strand Theater uh, with Atkins uh, Engineering. It's uh, one of the highlights of our golf uh, golfing year, and it's something we look forward to uh, working um, in the years f in going uh, as we go into the future um, to help benefit the Strand Theater. Uh, we were chosen. We were very excited to be chosen for several very prestigious uh, tournaments that we're going to be hosting this year. We're going to be hosting a USGA Mid Amateur Qualifying Tournament. The uh, Mid Amateur um, Championship is one of the USGA's largest uh, attended events, and we're happy to host the uh, qualifier locally here, which is very prestigious. Um, big thing for us, we've never done that one before. Uh, in um, 2016, we'll be holding the Georgia State Golf Association Public Links Championship. That's the best uh, amateur golfers that are not members of a private club uh, from around the state will be coming for that championship. We've held that uh, in 2011. It was a great event. Um, had gotten many accolades from the uh, GSGA that they were very happy to uh, once again be coming back to Cobblestone and we look forward to doing many more with them. Mosaic's uh, partnership as uh, Bill and Steve have noted before, um, we uh, re-upped our, our um, contract with you back in 2012 for another 10 years. Uh, we're very happy to work with the different um, entities within the county with the Parks and Recreation Department. Mr. Cannon is a huge uh, um, ally of ours and we look forward to working with him uh, any opportunity we can. Uh, and in the same token, we like to be able to help out and with them many times uh, through helping out with agronomic practices or with manpower or what have you. Um, in fact, once a year, uh, Mr. Cannon coordinates with a lot of the parks people to come out and help us with uh, some maintenance things that we can't always handle just on our own. Uh, and that's always a great day. We love having them come out. Uh, many of those guys do play golf, so we make sure and take care of them if they happen to come out uh, uh, after the fact. Um, 
the um, correspondence with finance obviously is a very important one. Uh, the changes that took place with the new agreement in 2012 have worked wonderful. Um, it's helped us to be much more reactive to business needs, <clears throat> excuse me, with business needs, and uh, as they said before, manage it much more as a business. Um, and then through different, uh, different discounted rates that we offer for all the uh, public service people, uh, we see them out there a lot, and we love the, the fact that they make uh, routine traffic uh, or routine uh, trips through our parking lot to help us with safety and security. In the uh, 2014 operations, um, as they alluded to before, we had a little bit of a dip in the year, but we still had a very profitable year. Um, as you can see there, through green fee, cart fees, driving range fees, food and beverage, um, other golf revenue, as well as the Windy Hill golf course revenue. The other golf revenue is mainly through our discount card sales. Um, our total revenue was $1,629,252, and total operating expenses of $1,392,690. Uh, for an operating income of uh, 236562 <clears throat> For uh, our, 215, our 2015 operating budget, uh, you can see there we are basing this off of 40,000 rounds. Uh, we did dip just below that this past year, but we feel very confident with the overseeding of the fairways that, that uh, Mr. Willie talked about before and um, the uh, enhanced uh, agronomic practices we're putting into place that we won't have the, uh, the dip in the... Uh, the uh, quality of our golf course like we had after the winter of last year. So our total revenue is, uh, we're forecasting at 1824855 and total expenses of 1486817 for a new operating income of $338,038. Our uh, capital improvements for 2015, uh, once again, as was on uh, Mr. Volkman's screen before, uh, the new agreement allowed for 5% of revenues to be invested back into cobblestone uh, in, the, in the form of capital improvements. Um, the, the new equipment that he spoke of, uh, that is on a capital lease, so that does take a, a good portion of that. But we do have, still have uh, plenty of projects that need uh, refurbishing, and, and many of them are taken care of through uh, normal operations, but a lot of them we do use these uh, ex, you know, extra funds over and above the uh, capital lease program to be able to get those done. At our, pro, at our not only cobblestone, but all of our mosaic properties, we have a, a, a practice of, you may have heard of the four disciplines of execution. Mr. Jim Hewling wrote a book. Uh, it's a practice of customer satisfaction and quality improvement. We put that into effect when this is the first full year that we've had this, and we're very proud of our, our not only our staff for the way they've reacted, but our results that we've gotten. <coughs> a big portion of that is collecting comment cards and finding out exactly what our customers think of our, our operation. Uh, we've done that very, very actively this past year, and we've seen what is called our net promoter score raised by 7.8 points. And basically what that is on the comment card, the last question is, how likely would you be to tell one of your associates or family members or friends, um, because of a positive experience you've had, to come back and visit this business? It basically measures how well are you growing your business. Even though we had some of the issues we talked about before on the golf course this past year, we were still able to grow our, our overall score by 7.8 points, which uh, in the matrix that's used for that, that's, a, that's quite a nice jump. So we're very happy with that. Um, next screen. And in Cobblestone Golf Course as a whole, as a general manager, I've been there since 2010. Uh, I, I'm very happy and proud to come to work at Cobblestone every day. Um, it says recently rated one of the top golf courses in Georgia. I can tell you that that line has not changed uh, in the, in the what, three times that I've been coming up here to do this uh, presentation with you because we continually get recognized as one of the top municipal golf courses in the country, not only in Georgia, not only in Cobb County, but in the country. And um, it's a truly great partnership, one that I, uh, I am happy to say I'm a part of and look forward to being a part of for many years. Any questions or Thank you. concerns? Or? Hey, Bill, um, I noticed that he's going in reserves for the capital, but that's not the... the we're still maintaining a 5% reserve at the end of this fiscal, right? Oh, well, that, that reserve is a 5% capital reserve that we establish every year for them to, right. to draw down. So they basically get a working capital number of 100000 which is basically operating cash to start the year. And then we calculate what that 5% capital reserve is for them to make any capital purchases. And like Terry mentioned, a lot of that is eaten up by the capital leases, but the, any residual they could – put into operations or other capital purchases that we have, uh, we'll get review with uh, Eddie Cannon, we'll just review anything that we 
go above and beyond those capital uh, leases. So, that, but that's reestablished every year. Every year, yes, okay. sir. Um, and the other the other point is we talked about the golf carts um, hitting their three year peak. I mean, we've got I don't know how many golf carts you have. Seventy five. Seventy five. So, are we in a cycle to replace all seventy five at the same time, or is there a way to? try to work towards replacing a third or a quarter of those every year? Well, something that's very important uh, as we, we work with our, our fleet of golf carts is to do a rotation. We do that to make sure that not one portion of them gets any more hours than the other and they, they kind of run through the, you know, the, their cycle um, equally. So right now, um, we, we don't have, we are, we're working with our vendor, which is Club Car. They're coming out as many of these are nearing their, their you know, what they consider their, their useful life. Um, we're getting many batteries changed out that are still under warranty. They're going through the, the fleet, the entire fleet right now, changing those out and checking any batteries that we can to extend the life. Um, there's times when you can't extend the life. Um, with the number of rounds that we do and the terrain that our golf courts have to negotiate, um, it's, we are coming up on a time where we need to look at, uh, at what we're going to do as far as replacing the fleet. Since the, we do have a purchase instead of a, a lease on those, and the entire fleet, or will it would it would be the entire fleet as they're all kind of aging at the same time as uh, as they move through time. Okay. Any other questions from the board for the team? Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our work session for today, and we'll be back at seven o'clock tonight. Thank you.